So welcome back to the Photography Files. I am back this time with Tony Black of Tony Black Magic, which Hi. is the newest iteration. We had a bit of a, a couple of rebrands, rebrands. And I first met you, I want to yeah. say, was it in the photographer's group? I mm. think it was. I think so. No, we met through, um, we actually met on naturality. Oh my God, yes. Yes. That's right. Shout out to Patricia Gaines D. Yes, Patricia. Still doing this work <laughs> out here. Because that's I joined it in 2004. Because mm -hmm. I've been natural. I had a little teeny mini afro and then some short twists. And uh -huh. so I joined it because I was considering locks and it was a good place to learn. And we were on air and I started my locks two years later. And then, as you know, a lot of us did, we all kind of drifted over to Facebook, which yes. I think is kind of sad. Because we had something special. Listen, the pink, pink, pink. <laughs> I agree. It was very special. I think just that whole shift from um, from what was the platform from online forums to a more fast paced social media. Just it was that natural evolution of social media that always happens. You know, from yeah, chat room. little folk. It had little folky pages where we would documenting our natural hair journey yes, and stuff. Beautiful. I logged in and I was like, wow, I forgot like pictures from when I had locks. Cause just like my rebrand, I've had a whole bunch of different hairstyles too. <laughs> so when we first met you, you were still in Hawaii at that time, right? Oh man. I don't even think I was in Hawaii at the time. Um, okay. I was in Oklahoma. I lived in Oklahoma wow. at the time. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to Hawaii. Hawaii to Alabama, and now you're in Texas. Yes, well, sort of. <laughs> I'm from Alabama, so I mean, I my ex husband was military, so we ah. definitely moved around. But yes, I went from um, since you've known me, I went from um, Oklahoma to Hawaii, back to Alabama for a short period of time, and then I I'm here in Texas. This is where I chose to settle. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So how's that been? How things you have know, changed with photography? It's been and in really, general. Yeah, it's been really interesting. Um, I think so. I was a completely different person. Like when we first met, I was. Um, gosh, it's been over ten years. It's been about ten years. Yeah, my daughter is eleven. So it's been eleven years. Um, you know, I was a young married Christian woman. <laughs> And since then I've evolved a lot. You know, I've, I've grown in myself. I've grown as a black woman. Um, I've grown in my photography. Everything that I do now is so centered in, um, like just black women, um, having a platform and being visible. And that was because I didn't have a platform and I didn't feel visible. And I was like, okay, if I feel this way, and it's taken this much for me to find myself and for me to um, find my voice and create my own space. I wonder how difficult it is for people, for black women who don't have the ability to create their own spaces, right? I, I created my own space because I'm just a very forceful person. <laughs> like I'm a, I'm a crap starter and I'm a bit of an instigator. And I, you know, I just kind of, I speak my mind and a lot of, a lot of people aren't like that naturally. Um, and so I try to create spaces for them and my photography has kind of followed me through that process. And it's been, it's been really interesting, okay. but good. And Texas okay. is really good for me. <laughs> Yeah, I went to a um, meet up there years ago and it was March and I was shocked. I was like, it's humid and hot in March. Because oh, at the time I was girl. living in upstate New York, so right on the right on Lake Ontario. So mm -hmm. it was cold. <laughs> yeah. You were like, what is this? You know, I will say I've never I've never had allergies before. I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama, pollen like crazy. Moved to Hawaii, we had the VOG, all of that. I moved to Texas, bam, <clears throat> chronic bronchitis severe allergies. Yo, ragweed is no joke here. <laughs> I go. So I got to ask, what inspires and moves you? So you mentioned, you talked a little bit about making sure women felt seen, especially black yes. women. And at one point you had started a photography project. It was, it wasn't, 
it wasn't really boudoir, but it was like women in being vulnerable with themselves. Tell me about yes. that vulnerability. Okay, so the project that I started, which I still have it, I, you know, I'm like a chronic project starter. I do finish them. I've been better at that. But okay, so the project was called Body Undefined. And it was for um, people who identified as female. And it was just, it's a project that allows women to be vulnerable. Um, uh, well, I say people. I, when I say women, I don't, like, I don't mean just people with vaginas. I mean women, any woman who, I, any person who identifies as a woman. So mm -hmm. the so when I say women, that's what I'm speaking of. So I'm just going to say women with understanding of that. Um, but my project was for um, the everyday woman to feel seen, right? So I'm a, I started off as a boudoir photographer. Uh, well, I didn't start off as a boudoir photographer, but I shifted to boudoir photography, which is very intimate um, photos and lingerie. There are different styles, different genres of that. You know, you have like pinup, um, you know, like really sexy that's closer to more pornographic images, all of those things. But they've always been very male centered and white woman centered. So if you Google, <laughs> if you Google boudoir, if you Google beautiful women or anything like that, you'll always see white women. That just mm -hmm. always pops up because, of course, we understand that in our society, whiteness is the standard of beauty. Um, and when it comes to sexuality, you know, and it comes to sensuality, it's always also revolving around white women. And so my whole thing is that the black female body is hypersexualized. As black women, we're hypersexualized. We're seen as as um, like sex symbols. You know, when you think about um, like our voluptuous bodies, you think of like video vixens and things like that. And my whole thing is that not everyone has the this you know the perfect body of what society says like most women we just have normal average bodies and that is okay most women are not even sexy like i people find me sexy but i don't identify as sexy like the average Ooh. woman i mean i don't i just that's we can talk about that in a little bit <laughs> but i just see we myself don't do that <laughs> I just see myself as me and you know I'm I'm more than just uh like a sexy person right like I love video games I love to read I'm I'm such a super dork and geek like I'm really goofy I laugh a lot and uh you know a lot of women identify with that and they don't identify with like the whole video vixen ideal so what I wanted to do is create a space for everyday women um, who just want to reconnect with their inner self, um, their divine being, their own sensuality, whatever that looks like for them, through being vulnerable um, and feeling free to just be yourself, right? In your skin, because that's who we are. And that also ends up removing the male gaze. And so that's what my project was. Um, I stuck a pan in it because it took off very quickly but mm, it took off with white women just submitting 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 I'm like okay I specifically said this is a space for black bodies black bodies mm -hmm. body undefined black bodies and more more so black bodies or people of color so I, at first I wasn't specific with black. I did say people of color though. Um, and I was very specific about it not being, like not surrounding white bodies, but you know. I, you know, I, I remember, <laughs> I remember when, because I remember the post that you put up. And it's funny because I just, I've been playing with my camera. I've been trying to get more comfortable yeah. being green with this interview series. Yes. This is the only time people will really see me wearing lipstick. I can't wear makeup. I've already gotten highs with anything other than yes. lipstick. So I love that color on um, you, by the way. And you don't need it. Your skin is amazing. But this morning I I, I made a, a video, right? Uh -huh. And it was talking about why I'm doing this interview series. I'm gonna reach out to some quilters and some embroiderers as well. Yes. Because those are some interesting paths. But one of the reasons I wanted to do this series, people are gonna be like, oh gosh, we heard this in the other video, but you're gonna hear it every time, is that as wonderful as these photographers that are on YouTube are, that these quilters on YouTube are, the quilting crafting circle, it's all white women with a couple yes. of exceptions. 
seen a couple of Asian women recently, but I've seen no black women. Yeah. With photographers, a lot of creative white men, a couple of Latino men, not even any black men, much less black women. I'm like, yeah. how about we talk to black people that are out there doing this thing? Some people yeah. of color that are out there doing this thing and doing yeah. it in an amazing way. But you're right, the focus does tend to be essential whiteness and i'm not saying that they are doing that deliberately it's just that in american society whiteness is the default it is it is and not only is the default not only is it the default but i feel like with it being the default they feel like they can be in any space and that they um they have access to any space and so even with me specifically saying hey guys i understand you know um, that you want to submit as well. Um, this space is for people who don't have a platform. And there are so many different boudoir publications um, and they all um, they all center like hypersexuality, which is fine for those spaces, but I wanted a space that didn't center that. And um, yeah, they would send me their, their pictures and I'm like, you know, I'm not going to publish this. And it, it got so excessive that I just said, you know what, I'm, I have to revisit this. And so I just, I paused it and I'm looking at um, how I can approach this in a different way. And so I have been slowly approaching it differently and I have other projects that I'm working on. Like uh, I'm writing a book. Um, okay. And yeah, and I do my self portrait series and I, I photograph. I was gonna say I did watch a live the other day. It was awesome. Yay, thank you. I did two of them, and I ended up doing a self portrait challenge, and I had like a huge turnout. So I think I'm gonna be talking about that more as well. And I think that's a way to introduce people um, to their own bodies, right? Like everyone doesn't want to be photographed by someone else. You know, everyone isn't comfortable with that. Um, and I'm like, you know what? Most of us, like not most of us, but many of us have cameras. Uh, and I run in a photography community anyway. Like my most of my friends are some sort of photographer, whether it's um, as a hobby or as a profession. So I'm like, you know mm -hmm. what? We have cameras. Just do it. Get in front of your camera. And I think yeah. that really destigmatizes um, a lot of the the hypersexuality that we have for ourselves. I even had men in it. It's like, yes, come on, black men. Yes. <laughs> it was amazing. Thank because they, I mean, they're like me. They love being behind it, but in front yep. of it is that mm -hmm. is a that a lot of us struggle with. Yep. Like we see, the, I agree. Everybody else, but we rarely see it in ourselves. Yep. And that's how I started. I uh, okay. To be fair, I always wanted to be a model, and my mom was like, "You don't need a model. Models, you know, photographers, they try to get young girls naked." <laughs> You know, back in the day when we were younger, our parents yeah. were like, all photographers are men and they take advantage of young girls. So mm -hmm. I couldn't get into modeling, but I ended up getting into photography. And just because of the life that I lived, I the older I got, the more shy I got. And so I really retreated in, into myself and I wanted to be behind the scenes. I didn't want to be seen. And um, as a stay at home mom, for, you know, I was a military wife and a stay-at-home mom. And we only had one car at one point when I was living in Hawaii. Oh, wow. And I didn't know anyone, but I wanted to take pictures. And so I was like, well, you know, my kid is sleeping. What can I do? And that's kind of when I first started taking pictures of myself. And okay. it was really uncomfortable because for the first time in a long time, the light was on me. I mean, of course, yeah. I wasn't sharing it with anyone, but, you know, I had to make myself visible. And that's when I kind of really started to learn myself. And so now, you know, I just do it. Um, and it's still difficult for me, you know, like I yeah. still have to be, there's a level of vulnerability you have to have to point a camera, like to get in front of a camera. Mm -hmm. And so like to point it at yourself and to not be able to hide anything is something special you can't hide <laughs> I'll tell you what i will submit something for that vulnerability project i'm so excited <laughs> yes so i gotta ask it natural light or flash both 
Okay. Did you yeah. start with flash or digital light? I started and with how did you light. learning? Okay. And then how did you go about learning flash? And what made you decide to jump into flash? Okay. So I started with natural light uh, just because it was there. You know, I grabbed a camera and I was like, oh, I can do this. And I learned the exposure triangle. I learned it in and out. It was difficult because I was like, oh my gosh, I'm learning something new. I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm completely self-taught too, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. But I learned the exposure triangle, moved to Hawaii. And I was like, <clears throat> I'm on the beach. I have like this natural, this sand that's reflecting the water that's reflecting all this light. Why do I need to learn off camera flash? Um, <laughs> but then I started shooting weddings and events with, um, with some people in Hawaii and they put lights in front of me and said, Hey, here, do this. <laughs> and so that was my introduction to, to off, um, off camera flash. Um, and I would do that, you know, kind of like the, I shoot military, um, like military balls. And so we would just have the, you know, your typical light set up with your two lights, your two lights facing the backdrop and, you know, the people come in and you take the picture. So I didn't really mm -hmm. learn much. I learned how to just, you know, expose for that. Um, and then even with weddings and receptions, I, you know, put a flash on my camera and learn that way. Um, or, you know, photograph with flash that way. But I didn't start using it creatively until really last year. And I learned from my self-portrait. Like, I keep going back to my self-portraits, but that's really how I learned. I was like, okay, I don't have to worry about irritating, you know, a model with my learning. So let me just turn this camera on myself and set this light up. And that's what I did. You know, and I started and I started actually in this room, in this bed. <laughs> I set up the light. I bought, I got my flash and I was like, you know what? I'm going to try this. I set my flash up and I did my very first um, self portraits of boudoir. And yo. <laughs> I remember that series. <laughs> yes. That's what started it. And so now, um, I will use it. Like if I, if I want to with clients, I will use it. Um, I do still photograph weddings with the collective. So of course I use off camera flash that way. Um, but I still gravitate towards natural light. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when I went to your website, you described yourself as an intimate lifestyle photographer. Yeah. Right. And many people will see that word and immediately go to boudoir. Yeah. Pinup. Or something yep. sexual, but that's not what you're talking to me. Talk to me nope. about the difference between the two when it comes to your photography, because I feel like okay. people I'm a lifestyle photographer or, but you said intimate, but I get, I'm gonna let you explain it. <laughs> yeah. So when people think of the word intimate, they think of sex. They think of sexy, they think of sexuality, um, but that's not really what that word means anyway. Like intimacy, when you really, hold on, I'm gonna, I actually wrote a blog post about this. So I'm pulling up my blog. Um, I don't even think I posted it. I didn't post it. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I hadn't posted it yet. But oh. when people think of, when people think of um, the word intimate, they think of, you know, something that's revolving sexuality or they think of sexual things but intimacy just really means personal and private right and so when I think of intimate lifestyle photography I think of you as uh, your vulnerable self I know we keep going back to the word vulnerability but that's really what it is like I photograph you in a way that most people don't get to see you and that's very intimate because it's personal and it's something that's private a lot of my work with my clients, most of my work, actually, I'd say about 90% of my work don't, doesn't even make it to social media just because it is so intimate. And it's not, it's not anyone removing their clothes. I mean, of course I do still photograph that and it does sometimes, or it does usually get to that. But a lot of times it's really just me photographing you as you are. We have a deep conversation. We talk about um, you know, we talk about things, we talk about who you are, what you like, um, who you are as a person, the things that you like that make you happy, the things that make you sad, your, your dreams, your goals, all of those things. And when we mm -hmm. talk about that, your, your layers, you know, your walls start to drop. 
and then the real you shines through. And to me, that's intimate lifestyle photography, right? I am not really one that, I mean, I do know how to pose. Um, and I feel like no matter what we do, unless you're doing like completely, um, like a, from a complete journalistic standpoint, everything that we do, we have to kind of pose. But the way that I pose people is I let them be themselves and I adjust from that you know um so once you lower someone's you know once you lower their wall a person's walls and you see who they are and you start talking to them and you start photographing it then they're naturally like in conversation they're naturally moving and they're comfortable and so then i can move them to different positions and photograph that and it gets really private and really personal and it's really it's a really beautiful thing but then on the flip side of that when I'm doing it for branding or if I'm doing couples, uh, because couples is something that I, I, I'm really into, especially since I do photograph weddings. <clears throat> that looks a little bit different. When it comes to intimate lifestyle portraits with branding, that's more so, um, it, that's not private, but it's still personal because it's me showing you for who you are. When you think of branding sessions, a lot of times it's, you know, someone with their computer or with their notebook and their you know stuff like that or holding it's almost like, it's almost like stock photography like you're yeah it's stock almost like stock photography which there's nothing wrong with that there's definitely a space for that because in my branding photography i take those pictures too but then i also peel back the layers and i take pictures of you as you are doing the things that you like to do talking about the things that you like to talk about and it just lowers that it it makes you more approachable right so in branding if i'm on if i'm on social media and i see a picture that of someone like being themselves or i love um, portraits with direct eye contact if mm. i see you if i scroll and i see a picture and you're looking right at me and it feels like you're peering through to my soul i'm gonna stop and i'm gonna see what it is that you're talking about and I feel like that's what intimate lifestyle photography does. It makes people pause and it makes them want to continue to read about you. And it opens them up to your brand and it makes you more approachable. Um, and then with couples, it's just me photographing couples um, as they are, enjoying, enjoying each other. So it's not your typical posed family portraits or couples portraits. It's me. Um, taking a picture of you dancing or, you know, me giving you prompts to like nibble on their ear. And then the other person doesn't know that you're going to do it. And that instant response, like that's so intimate, like alone photographing someone nibbling on their, on their partner's ear is an intimate act. But then seeing that response is even more intimate. And that's what makes it really special to me. So that's what intimate lifestyle photography is to me. And I have to kind of coach through that. Um, but I really work with showing that through my brand. So when people see it, they instantly know. And so when they're calling me, they're not thinking they're just about to get a, a boudoir photo session. Okay, cool. I love that. And you know, it's funny. Um, the, the photographs you're talking about, you can tell when the photographer has actually built a relationship with their subject. Because yeah. what you're talking about requires like connecting and building a relationship. And I think it goes back to there are some male photographers who are really good at it, but a lot yes. of people, both male and female, are not. And it yes. comes across in the there's yes. a separation, there's a distance, there's a stiffness. Yes. And you can absolutely opposed to it being a genuine moment. Absolutely. And I think that photography is really moving towards this. We don't call it this, but I think with lifestyle photography, this is what it's moving towards because there are books now and prompting your um, your clients. You know, um, there are books for prompting couples, there are books for prompting individuals, families, all of those things, and it helps you build a relationship. Um, a lot of photographers say that they're introverts. <laughs> I know you've seen that. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, a lot no, of photographers. <laughs> yeah, a lot of photographers identify as an introvert. I'm, I'm not really that introverted. I'm what is it, an ambivert? So if I take my Myers Briggs test, depending on when you catch me, I'm either going to I, I'm either going to be an ENFP or an INFP. I'm mostly extroverted, but I understand like I have introverted qualities. But anyway, um, a lot of photographers identify as introverts, and they find it difficult to connect to make that connection just because it revol revolves, it involves a level of um, 
out like a level of outward connection that a lot of people don't have who identify as introverts. So they've created books to actually help you connect. I use those books, but I mean, I connect with people naturally um, mm -hmm. just because I love talking. <laughs> As you can see, I love talking and I ask all the questions and I always want people to feel comfortable. So I, you know, I connect with people that way. And I never, I think that's also why I got away from family photography because I don't really always have a time, have the time to make that connection with everyone in the family. And people want to be photographed a certain way. Like they want to be photographed the way that they see themselves and not really how they are. And I totally yeah. believe in photographing people, you know, in their natural element. That brings me to another question. Um, okay, so I, I think it was in the group or yeah, it was in the group. Someone put the photo of four hours of work that he did and it was amazing, but I was like, see, this is why I will never make it. Because for me, I'm like, if I'm photographing you, it's because I find you interesting. It's because I find you right. unique or special or beautiful. And I know it's funny because people are like, oh, you don't like shave weight off or remove. I was like, I'll remove like obvious blemishes. Sure. Yes. I'll, I'll dim those down, but your face is your face. Yeah. Like I have a gap. Example, I have a gap in my tooth and I messed it up using a straw. It's a long story. I'll talk about it another time. I love but that. I, kind of, I want to get it fixed because my tooth started to turn because I was using a cup with a straw, blah, 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 blah. Whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, but I wouldn't take a picture and then say, hey, fill in the gap. Right. This is my face. I mean, if I ask you to take a picture, you're going to get all of it. Right. So I, do you do a lot of retouch work or do you, do you stray away from that a little bit or it, it's, it. look, and I, my, my hat's off to people who can do the retouch work. Cause I'm like, that is a skill. That is a skill yeah. I do not possess. So I love retouching. I do what's considered like a high frequency separation for retouching. So I clean up skin. Um, so the type of retouching that I do, and I've always done this, I'm, I am totally all for natural, um, but I will clean up. Well, I tell people that I will remove things that are not permanent, like pimples and bruises and stuff like that. But I don't change features. Like I don't do, like, I'm not going to make your waist smaller. I'm not going to, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, if it can't be fixed with makeup, then I'm not going, if it can't be fixed with makeup or if it can't, if it's something that's going to go away, then I'm not going to cover it up. Like if you have a big mole on your face, I'm not changing that. If you have, um, you know, like thinner lips and you want them to be larger, nope, not me, not doing it. If you want your waist smaller, <laughs> not doing it. But now with frequency separation, especially when I'm doing headshots, you know, I will clean up the face. I will um, remove dark circles and, you know, maybe smooth out the bags. Um, I will do a little bit of, I, you know, I love a good, I love a good face beat. I can beat your face <laughs> in Photoshop too now. <laughs> Not, but no, really, like the highlight and contour, you know, I will contour your face a little bit, um, just depending on what style of photo photography that we're doing. If I'm doing like an intimate lifestyle portrait session where it's, you know, like I'm photographing you in your house or in your bedroom or something like that. I'm not going to do heavy retouching. Like I said, I'll clean up your face a little bit. If you have blemishes, I'll clean those up, but I'm not doing drastic changes. Now, if I'm doing headshots, like all of the portraits that I've been posting from my self portrait challenge, I do retouch those just because it's, a uh, you know, you have your the light on you and it's showing every single pore almost. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm going to retouch your, I'm going to retouch my face. I'm going to retouch my client's faces, but I don't do heavy retouching. Okay. Yeah. Final question. Where did this home stretch? Um, actually, you answered this question already. I'll read the question for the audience. I had asked, blackness is a subject that you center and feature, but many people are chasing all the dollars, right? Where yes. they're like, oh, black people don't like to pay for pictures. Not true, but people think we're cheap. So um, you talked about what inspired you to center blackness as your work, but is there anything else you want folks to know that we haven't talked? Yeah. Um, let me think about that. So you said blackness is a subject that I center. Um, and you were talking about people who chase money. So 
for me, I've never been one to chase money. Like money is not a motivation for me. Don't get me wrong. I love having money. I love to shop. All of those things. Kind of necessity in today's society. Right. Listen, <laughs> most of us aren't getting it right now. But I like money is not a motivation for me. Um, <clears throat> seeing black people, seeing black people happy, seeing black people feel, um, you know, seeing black people seen and visible and having a platform to speak, seeing black people be carefree and just mm. just happy that really inspires me that motivates me and i just i want to see more of it and i do it for us but i also do it for our kids i feel like if if kids see us being carefree and being happy and and taking up space because something that i that i learned early on that we've all learned early on our parents will tell us when we go out don't say nothing don't ask for nothing sit down and be quiet. Don't be a grown mm -hmm. folks conversation. Da, da, da. Like all of these things that we've always heard. And of course it was a respect thing. But then when we look deeper at why, you know, our parents wanted us to shrink ourselves, you know, it's rooted in, you know, post-traumatic slave syndrome, all of those things. Um, but mm -hmm. looking at it now, <clears throat> we grow up in a space where we do have to shrink ourselves. We grow up in a society where microaggressions are are so great that we can't take up space. Like in the workplace, and you work in academia, like you understand there, you can't right. have a range of emotions because if you do, then you're seen as angry, right? Mm -hmm. You can't speak your mind because then you're seen as angry. You can't be passionate about anything because it's gonna always circle around to, are you okay? Are you upset? Mm -hmm. It's okay, just calm down. Like, don't tell me to calm down because I'm not mad. I'm not upset. I'm just expressing myself the same way that you would. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, like we, we're we always not, we're, we're rarely allowed to take up space, whether it's at work or even in our homes. And so I feel like if I can create a platform for you to take up space, then, and you get more comfortable with taking up space and your children see you take up space, then mm -hmm. your children, the children who are watching, the younger people who are watching you will say, oh, wait, I can do that. I can say that. I'm, it's okay for me to be here. I can take up space. I can exist yeah. and speak my mind. And like, that's really what motivates me. Like having younger people say, hey, I can be here and it's okay for me to be here and say whatever I need to say about how I feel. Like that really motivates me more than That's anything. Wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. So thank you so much for taking your Saturday morning to chat with me. No and uh, we'll see everybody next time. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>